Hello, we're going to be doing the prophet Nahum today. It's three chapters, but they're a little repetitive, dealing with the, the destruction of Nineveh, which of course was the capital of Assyria. The reason this book is so important to the Jewish nation is they could not understand how God could use such a cruel nation as the Assyrians to judge his people. No matter how bad his people were, how could God use someone so cruel? And I want to tell you, from the, from the uh, pictures and accounts, the Assyrians were absolutely brutal people. Uh, they would impale people alive, cut off their hands and heads, uh, drag them to death, put hooks in their lips, uh, bash the babies. Uh, it was, they were just the cruelest nation you can imagine. And so it was hard for the Jews to realize how God could use them, but God was real serious about his namesake, and the Jews had just turned from faith into ritual, and God used this nation as an instrument of his judgment. But now, God's going to judge them. And, and that's the thrust of this little book. I want to do a brief introduction with you, and uh, I hope you'll follow. If you have our set of study notes, you'll, you'll follow right along. Now, the name, uh, the author of, of course, this book is Nahum. We don't know much about him. His name means comforter, and you see that from Isaiah 57, 18, or compassion. All right. Now, he's called uh, an Elkoshite, which means he's from the town, apparently, of Elkosh, although some have said it's the family. Most think it's a geographical lo a location because of the pointing of the MT. Now, there are several traditions connected with this site. The, uh, an Arab tradition from the 16th century, which is very late, says that he is uh, one of the children of the exile whose parents lived right across the river, the Tigris River, from Nineveh. But that's very, very late. Jerome and Eusebius say that he is from Galilee because he mentions that in chapter 1, for, uh, 14. Others have said he's from the city of Capernaum. Because in Hebrew, it's Capernaum, the house of Nahum, but there's no real tradition or evidence to back that up. Uh, Pseudo Epiphanes, uh, in his Life of the Prophet, says uh, that he was a, from southern Judea. And all of this goes to show us that nobody knows where that city is. Now, the book kind of dates itself. In chapter 3, verse 8, it talks about no Ammon, which when interpreted means the, th the city of Thebes which was the capital of southern Egypt. Now, we know that Ashurbanipal, one of the last strong kings, um, that he captured this city in 663 B.C. So we know it's probably after 663 because this city is used, a very strong city, with water protecting it, which fell. Now, the other date, terminus date, is when Nineveh fell in 612. So somewhere between 663 and 612 is the date. Uh, most modern scholars would say it probably occurred, the writing, around the death of Ashurbanipal, 633, when his weaker children began to lose part of the empire. And uh, Babylon became independent, and Egypt became independent, and that seems to be probably a good time, okay? Um, basically, the structure of the book is typical style of the prophets. It's classical prophetic literature. And yet this prophet is very independent in some of his metaphors and ways. He's not dependent on anybody. Yet there is a couple of borrowing. From Nahum 1.15 is almost exactly Isaiah 52.7. And Nahum 1.4 is very close to Isaiah 33.9. So somehow Nahum is related to Isaiah. How, we don't know. Let me give you a brief history, if I could, of the relations between the Assyrian Empire and the people of God. Okay, I'm going to uh, begin back, if I could. Uh, with Nahum writing about the fall of Assyria because this was such a, a very important theological point to the Jews who had been, the northern ten tribes had been devastated uh, by this nation, okay? Um, second, the first recorded occurrence was in the reign of Jehu, the son of Amri. We're talking about the northern ten tribes now. Uh, the Assyrian king, Sh Shalmaneser III, and he lived from 858 to 824 B.C., forced payment of tribute from Jehu. Now, this continued under his successor, uh, Nadad Nir Neri III, with 810 to 
to 782 B.C. is when he lived. The first major invasion and in deportation of the northern ten tribes, known as Ephraim, Israel, or Samaria, occurred in the reign of Mechem, and he was the king of Israel from 752 to 732, by the next major king of Assyria, Tiglag-Pileser III, who reigned from 745 to 727. Now, apparently this king re replaced Pekah, who reigned from 740 to 732, with Hoshea, 732 to 722, and 722 is when the uh, fall occurred. Now, the biblical references for that are 2 Kings 15, 29, 1 Chronicles 5, 6, 2 Chronicles 30, 6 and 10, and Isaiah 9, 1. Now, the domination of Palestine continued, and Judah was certainly affected during the reign of Ahaz, 735 to 715, who also paid tribute to Assyria. Now, Hoshea tried to ally Israel with Egypt and was invaded by Salmaneser V, and he reigned Assyria from 727 to 722. Now, he died before the siege of Samaria, a very strong geographical city, fell to the son, Sargon II, who reigned 721 to 705. So Israel is deported now under Sargon II, taken captive and resettled in Media. And this was the policy of the Assyrians. Once they defeated somebody, they had removed them from their homelands to be more controllable. We see that in several passages. Uh, 2 Kings 17, 3 through 20. 2 Kings 18, 20 and 21. Isaiah 7, 8. Isaiah 8.4, Isaiah 10.11, Isaiah 36.20, Hosea 9.3, 10.6, 10.14, and 11.5. Okay? Now, in Judah, the king is the godly king Hezekiah, 7.28 to 6.87. He had succeeded Ahaz and refused to pay tribute to Assyria, 2 Kings 18. Judah was invaded by Shennacherib, the next major king of Assyria, 704 to 681, probably around 701 B.C. But this is where God sends the death angel and destroys 600,000 of the Assyrian army in one night. And they retreat, of course. And we find that from Isaiah chapter 10, verse 16. Isaiah 36, 1, all the way through Isaiah 37, 38. 2 Kings 18, 13 through 19, 37. And 2 Chronicles 32, 1 through 31. Now, after Hezekiah died, his evil son Manasseh was forced to submit to the next Assyrian monarch, uh, Ezra Hayden, 681 to 669. And we see that from 2 Chronicles 33, 1 through 11. Now, Ezra Hayden's son, Asher Banapal, that's the one we talked about, took Thebes earlier. He reigned from 638 to 633 B.C. He was the last strong Assyrian king. During his, uh, the end of his period, or right after his death, several important world events begin to occur. Number one, Nebo Pelazer, the first ruler of the new Neo-Babylonian Empire, of which Nebuchadnezzar will be a descendant, Nebo Pelazer started 625 to 605, set up an independent Neo-Babylon. Uh, Samalek the first Pharaoh of Egypt, 664 to 609, set up an independent Egypt. Josiah, the godly king, 640 to 609, restored Judah to independence. And uh, Krakus, <laughs> 625 to 585, set up an independent media. So you can see that the empire was falling apart. Nineveh, the capital, fell to a coalition of media, Neo-Babylon, and the Scythians around 612. The other ancient capital, Asher, had fallen in 614 B.C. Nineveh covers, the site is huge, 1,850 acres with eight miles of reinforced walls. That was the city. And archaeologists have found it. It is totally devastated. It's so devastated uh, that when an ancient historian was standing on the site in 400 B.C., he didn't even recognize where the city had stood. thought it was a natural hill. Isn't that something? Total devastation. Now, the two commentaries I'd like to recommend to you, this is the Foreign Apple Commentary series. It's the book of Nahum by Walton Mayer. It's the most detailed one I've ever seen. It's almost more than you want to know, to tell you the truth. And another good one, I think, is the Bible commentary on the Minor Prophets by Theo, and I'm going to spell the last name, L. A-E-T-S-C-H, okay? I've taken part of your introduction out of one of these pages, so I hope you'll get this commentary.
Now, let's look at, the, look at the Bible itself. Turn to the book of Nahum. Best way to do it is turn to Ezekiel and turn right, and you'll find it in just a minute. Now, notice it mentions the first chapter talks about the destruction of the nation of Assyria, symbolized in its capital, Nineveh. The oracle. Now, this is the only book in the Old Testament that says it's both an oracle and a vision. Oracle is the word burden. It really came from to lift up. And it's usually used in the sense of judgment, okay? Now, the book of a vision, this is trying to show that it is not the word of this man, but a, a prophecy from God, okay? Now, people have said, well, he's unfair. But I want to tell you, this whole book is based on the covenant at Sinai. God held his own people accountable to that covenant, and now God's going to judge the Assyrians because of their evil, too. So God is faithful to his covenant. That's the whole thrust. Now, the Elkishite I talked about in the introduction. Notice it says in verse 2, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. This word jealous is a love word. And I think that's true. We're talking about God's wrath here. Look at the words. Jealous, avenging, avenging, wrathful, vengeance, adversaries, reserves his wrath for the enemy. Now, you've got to balance verse 2, which speaks of God's anger, with verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. This is emphasizing the justice of God. Sometime it's the justice of God seen in his wrath. And sometimes it's the justice of God seen in his love. But it's the justice of God. Now, this is going back to the Sinaitic covenant, this phrase. You might want to see Exodus 34, 5 through 7, Numbers 14, 18. God is love, but he also, when his, when his love is spurned, turns to wrath. Now, the people, both the, the uh, Jewish people and apparently the Assyrians had taken advantage of God's patience and love. See Romans 2, 3 through 5, 2 Peter 3, 9, where that's a characteristic of fallen man. Now, in a whirlwind of the storm is his way, and the clouds, the dust beneath his feet. We're going to use natural phenomenon as a sense of God's presence. And then we're going to use upheavals in nature as a sign of God's coming and judging man. Notice it mentions he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. Because of Psalms 106, 9, I believe this refers to the Exodus also. Bashan and Carmel and Lebanon, these are three proverbially fertile places, one in the Transjordan, two in northern Israel, that God's going to dry up in his wrath, okay? Now, notice down verse 7 where it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. The Bible is replete with this unbelievable paradox between the, the wonderfulness and the severity of God. You ought to see Romans 11, 22. That's what we're talking about here. Now, when it says a stronghold and a refuge, there are so many passages that deal with that. Psalms 27, 1, 28, 8. Psalms 46, 1 and 2, Isaiah 17, 10, Isaiah 25, 4, Jeremiah 16, 19, Joel 3, 16. A stronghold, a refuge, a high tower. Boy, what a great thing. And notice what it says, the Lord knows those who take refuge in Him. God knows the attitude on behalf of His people. And he responds to that. Now, in verse 8 it says, with an overwhelming flood, He will make complete end of its sight. Now, this idea is talking about Nineveh. If you look over at chapter 2, verse 6, where it says the gates of the rivers were opened and the palace was dissolved, we realize from history that all this occurred in one of the very, very wet months, the month of Ab. Now, from history, from, uh, I think it's Diodorus Silius, S-I-C-U-L-U-S, his library of history, section 2, 27, listen to what he says. In the third year of the siege of Nineveh by the Medians and Babylonians, a series of heavy rains swelled the Euphrates, he meant the Tigris, um, flooded part of the city and overthrew the wall to a length of 20 strata. That's over two miles the walls fell. Well, that's how the invading troops got in, the, the flood. Now, it says in chapter 2, 6, they destroyed the floodgates and the palace is dissolved. Well, the city was built with, on, on some places where the, the Euphrates and two of the rivers meet. And when they blew up these floodgates, they probably stopped the gates, let the water build all the way back up in the dam, then let those gates go and they rushed through the city and knocked down the wall and the enemy get in very, very quickly. And that's probably what we're referring to here. Now, make a complete end of its sight and pursue his enemies to darkness. In the darkness, it refers to the word Sheol. Look at verse 9. Whatever you devise against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Now, some have doubted that, the, that Nineveh was apparently very strong when Nahum wrote. And some said, oh, God wouldn't do this. And he promises, distress will not rise up twice. There'll be no more acts from this place. Now, in verse 10, the word tangled thorns has caused some confusion. Some have seen it as referring to uh, 
their confusion, and others have seen it referring to their strength, so we're not sure. When it says drunken with drink, this may be a metaphor of pride and success. They weren't worried about an invading army because their city was so strong. Or we have traditions in history, I think going back to Herodotus, that the night that Nineveh fell, her soldiers provided drink and they became drunk and they snuck in the gates after the walls fell down and took the city almost without a, without a real bad fight, though they killed everybody in there. Man, the blood ran deep, I want to tell you, that day. Now, notice where it mentions in verse 11, uh, one who plotted evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Many have seen this as a personal reference to Shennacherib as he invaded Judah in 2 Kings 18.13. That may be true, we just can't be certain. Now, mine says a wicked counselor. It's the word Belial. It's used quite often in Hebrew. It means the worthless one. The Septuagint translates it the lawless one. It's used in Deuteronomy 13.13 and 2 Corinthians uh, 6.13. Uh, 15. Some say it means a place from which there is no ascent, like shield. It's used of a title of the devil in the New Testament, okay? Now it says, though they are full strength and likewise many. Now this refers to the fall, the complete fall of Assyria. Even so, they'll be cut off. Now this is the word mode, but some think it means mailed or, or wearing armor. And maybe that's true. We'll pass away. They'll pass right through them. Though I afflicted you, this refers to either Judah or Israel, I will afflict you no longer. He's going to break the yoke of Assyrian power. Look at verse 14. The Lord issue a command concerning you. Your name will no longer be uh, perpetrated. Perpetuated, excuse me. Well, this is the word seed. We know from Assyrian documents that the kings were very, very concerned with their, their name continuing. And here, their name is going to be cut off. I will cut off idol and image. Now, the idol is that which you carve, and the image is that which you cast in metal. Now, we'll see Deuteronomy 27, 15. We know from Assyrian records um, that they used to destroy the idols and uh, tear down the temples of the people they conquered and took some of the gold and silver images to their own temple. Well, now this is going to happen to them. The major gods of the Assyrian pantheon are listed in your outline. There's many of them, and so they were very, very superstitious, and it's all going to fall. All right? Now, some have thought that from the house of your gods, I'll prepare your grave. Some say this refers to the death of Shennacherib, who was killed in the temple, we learn from 2 Kings 19.37. The word contemptible in the last part of verse 14 means light, much like weighed in the balances and found warning of Daniel 5.27. Now, verse 15 is the only uh, verse, I think, that's quoted in the New Testament here as far as the idea of uh, the feet of him who brings good news. It comes from Isaiah 52, 7, and it's quoted in Romans 10, 15, about the messengers coming that, that, that uh, Assyria had fallen. And look, the feasts are going to be restored in Judah. And pay your vows. If you prayed to God that you'd do something if he destroyed Nineveh, now he's done it, you pay your vow. Never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. And it was they were utterly destroyed. No trace. Nothing left. Boy, it was unbelievable. Now, in chapter 2 is a kind of a detailed description of the physical fall of the capital of Nineveh. Okay? When it starts out, the one who scatters you has come up against. Now, some say it refers to the Assyrian uh, uh, deportation policy that Neo-Babylon followed, but it refers to the invaders. Now, other prophecies against Nineveh are found in Isaiah 10, 5 through 27, and Micah 5, 4 and 5. But this is a detailed one. Notice it mentions here, man the fortress, watch the road, strengthen your back, summon all your strength, for the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob. Now that means he has cut off the pride. That's what Mailer says it is, and I, and I think that may be true. Uh, Israel was exiled, she'll be brought back. Look at verse 3. This is the invaders. Their shields, their mighty men, are colored red. Now, the Hebrew term implies dying. You might want to see Ezekiel 23, 12 through 21. We know from the Assyrian and Babylonian records that the shields and the cloaks of some of their warriors, especially their, their, sold, their officers, were dyed red, either from the blood of enemies are red in, in the symbolic color of the nation. Now, later, some said it means bronze shields, using 1 Maccabees 6.39 and Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, 13.12.5, uh, and uh, Xenophon's, but 6.41. But uh, I don't think you can buy that. that, that that's much later than here. So I don't think it's a bronze shield. I think it's colored red. Notice the cypress spears of verse 3. They're also reddish in color and very strong. In verse 4, the, this is about the streets before the city wall. There were suburbs surrounding the city of Nineveh. Well, the enemy had already captured the suburbs and were driving the cavalry up and down their streets they were so proud of. In verse 5, they even attacked the walls of the city now. 
It says they stumble in their march. Well, no, it means they crowd together to attack the wall. The word in my New American Standard, uh, matlet, is really a word of somehow protecting the soldiers from digging into the walls or attacking the gates. Uh, in the Roman army, it was called a tardis, where they put their shields over their heads. But here, it's just a way of protecting those soldiers. Verse 6, the waters wash away the empire. We learn from archaeology that the main hall was 40 feet by 150 feet, and it had bronze lions and marble, white marble, it's a bull, it's a beautiful thing, but it fell swiftly. Notice in verse 7, she is stripped. Now the word here is H-U-Z-Z-A-D, A-B, excuse me, and many just put the word there. It seems to be an unknown Hebrew word. It may mean Assyria herself represented in the queen mother. Now she's going to be stripped naked. Now that's what Assyria did to everybody else, to shame them. Here it's going to happen to her. You might well see the same use of this in, in Nahum 3, 5, Isaiah 47, 2 and 3, and Hosea 2, 10. What she did to others is returning to her own head. Um, in verse 8, her soldiers flee their post, the city. In verse 9, the plunder is so great you can't even number it. She had been plundering and taking tribute for all her history. She was a cruel, vicious water of money and greed, and now it's all going to be lost to this invading army. And nobody's going to be sorry. Everybody's going to clap when they hear it. That's the idea. In verse 11 and 12, the metaphor of lions. We know from Assyrian documents that their kings often called themselves lions, and they kept lions as pets. They were almost a symbol. Like I said, that bronze lion was in the, in the uh, major chamber of the Nineveh court. Um, so that you were, it's pictured here as lions, okay? Um, in verse 12, it says, And filled his lair with prey. This seemed to be the stored wealth uh, that we mentioned uh, earlier, okay? Notice the Lord of Hosts in verse 13. That's the military title of God used so often in the prophets uh, that refers to God as the military captain of the armies of heaven. So God is bringing this military fall on this powerful empire. The Jews need to hear that God was still sovereign in history. He used Assyria, but now he would judge Assyria. In chapter 3, it's just another deal about the fall. It deals, calls it the bloody city. This means innocent blood, Habakkuk 2, 12. Where they were so cruel, they impaled people alive. They skinned people and put their skins on the walls of the cities. They dragged the people to death. They put hooks in their lips. They blinded the eyes of kings. They hung people up with their hands till they, or their feet till they died. Oh, they had all kind of torture to, to try to dis, discourage rebellion, okay? Notice it says her prey departs, and that's looking back to the metaphor of the lions in the last chapter. Notice it mentions down in verse 4, many horlatries and uh, mistress of sorceries. Now we know from horlatries, the goddess Ishtar was the major goddess of Nineveh, the god of love, many temple prostitutes. And we know from other accounts uh, that the, they were very occult and very superstitious in their practices. Now Jonah gave them the truth. That's what the book of Jonah is all about. They had the gospel preached to them about the good news of Yahweh, but they reverted back to their old gods at some point. Notice in verse 5, I will lift the skirt over your face. This is a sign of shame like we talked about earlier. They did to these women. You might want to see Jeremiah 11, 26, Ezekiel 16, 37, Hosea 2, 3. It would happen to them now. Um, verse 7, the Assyrians were hated for their cruelty. Nobody, nobody cared when they fell. And then verse 8 is this deal about uh, no Ammon, which is really Thebes. You see Jeremiah 46, 25. It, they fell to Asher Banapal in 663. And now the reason that's so significant Thebes was a very fortified city. It had water protection from the Nile and some of the tributaries. It had a powerful military machine in Egypt and Libya and put. But she fell. And what the prophet's saying is, you're going to fall, Nineveh, just like you destroyed Thebes. You're going to be destroyed. And so you're going to reap what you sow. That's what it's talking about. Verse 10, also her small children were dashed to pieces at the head of the street. The children were killed in these ancient... Uh, takeovers of cities for three reasons. Number one, they couldn't travel very well. 2 Kings 8, 12, Psalms 137, 9. They cut off the future hope of these people and demoralized them, Isaiah 13, 16, and 18. And it just made the people more slaves. Hosea 10, 14, and 13, 16. Kill the children. The idea you too will become drunk is a metaphor of judgment. It may be taken literally. Um, if you look at chapter 1, verse 10, their strongholds were going to fall like ripe fruit in the invader's mouth. Look at verse 12. Verse 14 is a series of five imperatives that talk about the 
you know, get ready, get ready, get ready, but it'll be of no avail. The fire will consume you. We know from history the last uh, Syrian king got all his wives and all his concubines and all his officers into his palace and killed himself and burnt the palace with fire, committed suicide before they got in. Verse 15 talks about that the, the, the Syrian military power will not help. Verse 16 says their commercial power will not help. Number 17 says their government administration will not help. And number 18 says they're all dead. They're all sleeping. Look at verse 19. Everybody's going to clap their hands. No one's going to come to their help. No one's going to rejoice, be sorry for them. Everybody's going to rejoice that Nineveh failed because of the cruelty of the Assyrian Empire. And for the Jews who were trusting God, it was a sign of the justice of God. God told them he took them out of the land because of their sin. And yet, because of a serious sin, he's going to judge them and destroy them as a nation. Though the Jews are going to be brought back and repopulated. And so it's, it's, a, it's a book of judgment, but you've got to remember it's in the light of God's justice. He sent Jonah this to them, and they repented briefly, but they didn't stay that way. And God says, the soul that sins, the nation that sins, it will surely die. That's a pretty good word to America, too. Um, if God spares us, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for the way our society is going. So here's a Hebrew prophet dealing just with the fall of Nineveh in very graphic, very specific ways. People have criticized him saying he's a cruel prophet and just, he doesn't talk about Israel's sins. Well, I think he does because he deals with the Sinai covenant. J J Israel was judged because she broke that covenant. Assyria is going to be judged because she didn't live up the light she had, apparently from Jonah. And so I've enjoyed being with you. Get these two commentaries and any other commentary you can find the Minor Prophets will be helpful. There's not any real good ones out. And uh, we're going to be dealing with them in the next few weeks. Well, I've enjoyed being with you. Have a good week. God bless you.